Welcome to DNA Today. I'm Jan Vitkowski. And I'm Dave Miklas. We're here at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory discussing news about DNA. And today's news is about genetically modified or GM crops. And what's so new about that? It's been done in Mesopotamia for a long time. Where's Mesopotamia? <laughs> the Fertile Crescent, yeah. 10,000 years yeah, ago. 10,000 years old. History and geography is better than mine. Anyway, the difference these days, of course, is that with recombinant DNA or genetic engineering, you can transfer genes between species. And in the topic that we're covering today, you can take a gene from a bacterial cell, the gene that's involved in herbicide resistance, and you can put that into important agricultural crops like cotton, uh, canola, soya, uh, corn. And this means that a, a, a farmer can plant a field with these crops, allow them to grow, and then treat the whole field with herbicide selectively killing off just the weeds in the field and leaving the, the crop intact. Now farmers use GM crops because they improve yield. That's what they're really after, of course. But they also uh, save tilling, which improves the soil fertility mm -hmm. and cuts down on runoff. So these are great things. The majority of people in the United States would be surprised to learn that most of the fresh vegetables and processed foods we eat have some genetically modified component. Now in Europe, this isn't the case, where the majority of people really disdain GM foods. Yeah. One of the concerns is that these, uh, particularly in terms of herbicide resistance, that these herbicide resistance genes will escape from the crops and enter the wild plants. And you can imagine having a, a super weeds that are now not killed off by any sort of herbicide. Now one way you could potentially get around this is to put the genetically modified gene in a compartment within the plant cell called the chloroplast. This is the part of the cell that produces uh, sugar but also makes the plant green. Now chloroplasts are inherited entirely from the mother plant so that means that a pollen grain doesn't have any chloroplasts and if you were to genetically engineer a new gene into a chloroplast the chance of it escaping into the wild by wind and pollinating a wild plant would pres presumably be pretty small. And a group in Germany is just trying to determine how often this happens experimentally. They made tobacco plants that were transgenic for jellyfish protein, green fluorescent protein, that fluoresces when you shine light on it. And they, made, uh, they took pollen from those plants and used them to fertilize non-transgenic tobacco plants and they examined over two million seedlings. And of those two million seedlings, they only found about six uh, that showed evidence of transmission of the green fluorescent protein via the pollen, which is a, about one in 300,000. Yes, now this was in a laboratory experiment, or as you would say, laboratory <laughs> experiment. Uh, pretty small rate of transmission, right. so the authors of the paper thought that in fact the transmission in the wild would be even smaller. Now, you're European, so how do you think this story will square with Europeans? I don't think it'll have much effect on the critics. 